I'm so delighted to be here. Um, my name is Alison Powell, and I'm the, an assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communication at the London School of Economics, where I lead a program called Data and Society, which um, comprises a master's degree uh, in social science that focuses on data and society, and also um, that involves a research group, a growing research group, um, that's concerned with some of the issues that are kind of the consequences of the increasing datification of our everyday experience. So today I'm going to give you a bit of a kind of um, broad social perspective on some of the concerns that to me underpin the project of the virtue um, en uh, endeavor. And I don't know if Irina um, mentioned this to any of you, but this is a three-year project We've also spent three years trying to get the funding. So in a sense, it's a six-year project. It's a major intellectual endeavor that has already been unfolding over time. And um, I think it touches on some of the things that are central to my own research, but that might also drive the things that you care about in your world. And one of the th questions that I kind of start with is the question of why does this matter? So why do we care that algorithms make decisions or that social media platforms um, hold all of our data and then use it to market to us? Why do we care that our Alexa-connected devices might be overhearing what we're saying? There was one response that says, well, I don't really care at all. But actually, people do care. And people care enough that the discussions about the consequences of connected life are expanding and unfolding and driving projects like ours. And so my answer is that when we give up our data, we are not giving up our data to the cloud. We're giving up our data to some very specific kinds of intermediaries. And these intermediaries structure our ability to speak, listen, and be heard on issues that matter to us. And I'm a communication scholar. It's really important to me how people are able to speak, how people are able to influence their world and act upon it. And so these are very primal and, and primary concerns for me. So technical systems, as well as social structures, have always influenced this capacity that people have to speak, listen, and to be heard, to have voice, to be able to act. But I think something has changed fundamentally. In the last 20 years, we've seen a movement away from an interest in expanding citizen rights to gain access to communication technologies and towards a kind of structuring of our experience in terms of what data we produce. And this underpins the sort of transformation of the internet as a technology of access and connectivity into the internet of things as a technology of data absorption, analysis, and management. So I think we are in a, in a very um, interesting moment in terms of constructing um, what might be a new set of frames for citizenship. Because these technologies of datification, that is transforming more and more of life into data, to make everyday acts into streams of data and make those data available through platforms. This creates new dynamics, new relationships, and they have a significant impact on how we're able to speak and listen and be heard. And one of the things I'm interested in is how we act about things that matter to us collectively. So how we might think about our capacity to be citizens, even good citizens, if you like. Um, not in the sense of citizens as um, having a passport of a particular country, but citizens as people who act in places that they live, places they care about, and contexts where they think what they do matters. And we can see that the Internet of Things sensor technologies give us a good way of perhaps being able to influence civic conversations, for example, about air pollution. Um, and I know many people here at ITU have done projects that have involved citizen sensing networks, expanding the ability of sensing technologies to spread out into the world and to, to, to create a conversation based on data. We also have technologies um, that allow us to report things that we observe and um, send that information back to governments. 
Um, and so these are all different ways that citizenship um, can be enhanced or changed or shifted by the expansion of data collecting, managing, and sharing technologies. But these also create really significant dilemmas. And the dilemmas have to do with moving from this idea of the internet as a platform for communication to the internet of things as a platform for data collection um, analysis. And data processing also raises some very significant ethical questions that have to do with the consent that we ap apply to any data that is collected. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how data processing, uh, data processing means that some of the principles of consent are very difficult to apply, creating kind of legal and normative problems that, we, um, that are associated with the expansion of the um, Internet of Things. But there are also um, changes in the ways that we position ourselves as ethical subjects um, within this shift towards data citizenship. We, might, we have a lot of personal responsibility for the data that we produce, but we have no power to actually limit that data or, in fact, to, to control very effectively where it moves away from us. So these are some of these um, initial dilemmas. And I'm going to talk through the first dilemma, which is the dilemma that is just relating to the movement uh, from the internet as a platform for communication to the internet of things as a data intensive technology. Then I'm going to talk very briefly about some of the ethical issues. Um, and I think Alessandro is going to talk more specifically about those. And then finally, I'm going to um, briefly outline some possible responses that we might have. And the responses are the place where you will then hear me talk again about ethics. What I'm trying to do in this talk is explain to you about why I care about data ethics. And I care about data ethics because of these dilemmas of citizenship. So what I've noticed is that it's possible to see a shift in ways of talking about and building support for citizenship that moves from thinking about citizenship as related to access to a network towards citizenship as a kind of production of data. And my example here is to think a little bit about how governments describe what they expect from their citizens. Um, and I have two um, images on this slide. And they're separated by 15 years. And the first one is a Government of Canada um, uh, sort of policy slide talking about the ways that the Government of Canada invested in expanding access to the internet as an essential communications infrastructure. And in the early 2000s, and many of you are not old enough to remember this, but I've been doing this for a long time, so I remember, the information society was on the ascendant. There was a notion that we were going to become a more effective civilization and a more effective society by increasing access to information. And increasing access to information essentially meant expanding access to the internet and expanding the number of computers that could create information that would become accessible on the internet. <coughs> So throughout the 1990s and into the early 2000s, these policy processes um, collided with the expansion of the IT industry and created a great business opportunity for a lot of companies to get in to this policy space and be the access providers. And um, for example, Cisco Systems um, provided lots of technologies to support these um, policy processes like the expansion of school net community access and the expansion of government information online. So we had on the one hand a kind of vision of a better society as a society with increased access to information, and on the other hand an, expansion, an expanded role for large IT companies in delivering their business, their, their, uh, their business in relation to this policy project. Fast forward 15 years, and we look at the right hand of the slide, and now we have the same IT companies promising not access to information, but a smart interconnected grid that absorbs data produced by citizens 
to allow for the optimization of government provided services. So no longer is the kind of framework for this being about citizenship as getting access to information and being able to participate in a network of relationships. It is now much more about individuals being um, able to produce data that can then be taken up by a decision-making entity and used to optimize service delivery. So recently I did some empirical work to actually map out um, how the large technology companies are positioning what they are providing to, um, to, to governments. And there were sort of three main areas. Um, I analyzed 100 different smart city um, uh, service provision companies to see what they were trying to sell to cities, um, and I discovered that they um, largely broke down to be um, products that would provide data analytics, data aggregation, and real-time monitoring. And so all of these are technologies of optimization, which means that they are predicated on the city government needing access to lots of data and needing to be able to optimize something about the function of their government. This is not about providing access to the data to the citizens, it's much more um, about providing a more optimal view of what the citizens are producing in terms of their data. And Optimization, of course, depends on effective prediction, which means that um, there's a very important space for intermediaries to develop predictive or risk management strategies. And so this is interesting, and I think this, um, if, uh, as you're in an IT university, none of this is news to you. But from a social science perspective, this raises some really interesting questions. And the questions are around when a main framework for your civic life is in relation to optimization, some things are going to be easier to fit in than others. Some things are going to be easier to optimize than others. And furthermore, if your optimization depends upon people sharing data all the time, what happens to these bigger ethical questions? So, this is a framework that I developed that kind of maps out some of the ethical problems with a, with the op with a kind of uh, a, a full optimization perspective. This is a framework that sketches out how data is used within an Internet of Things paradigm. And so we're, we, we, I've, I've tried to sketch out how different kinds of intermediaries are required to actually make this data useful, and how these intermediaries actually do have quite a lot of power in defining what is good data, what is bad data, and in fact, what, is, what the action of a good citizen is. So we think maybe a good citizen used to be somebody who you know, voted or was informed or participated in public debate, a lot of these, pr these processes imply that a good citizen is a citizen that produces a lot of data. So what are the processes of, um, of, of you know, broadly conceived that um, map out in relation to Internet of Things data gathering and decision making? So first you have to acquire data. And that's done in many different ways. It can be done through large-scale sensors, um, like traffic management cameras. It can be done through ci um, citizen science installations that are trying to acquire data to, to create a public conversation about air pollution, for example. It can be done by all kinds of um, personal technologies, um, like the one that I have a photograph of here, um, uh, fitness trackers. Um, one of my computer science friends um, has proposed a fake technology called the Ambient Loo that just collects all kinds of ambient information about using the toilet. So we could even have sort of hypothetical design futures um, locations for acquisition of data. And of course, the Ambient Loo could optimize all kinds of things that we have not yet thought of optimizing. Consider that. So acquisition is only the first step. Then you have data aggregation, analytics, and action. And the implication here from existing frameworks for privacy is that we should have kind of control of our own personal data. But in reality, that breaks down right after the first step. In order to make any decision 
based on large-scale aggregated data, you have already gone beyond the, 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 the boundary of personal data. And some of the issues related to the Internet of Things um, th that include and go beyond these kind of civic questions that I've raised have to do with how you know um, how much of this process could potentially be under personal control. Not much of it is, in fact, under personal control. So um, the analytics um, of transport data, for example, are based on large-scale aggregations of transport data. And you can see patterns in people's commuting, and you can see um, uh, uh, sort of uh, large-scale movements over time. Um, but it is actually possible to de-anonymize data and to find out things about individual people. Uh, and so there, the, so there are these uh, very um, problematic dilemmas about individual responsibility versus collective responsibility, about the, the value that is derived from aggregating data versus the ethical frameworks that imply that the um, point of consent needs to be the individual. So the metaphor of the cloud um, breaks down because action, for example, may be difficult to undertake with partial data. Um, so the relationships between the responsibilities in each, uh, that, that are um, outlined at each of these levels can be controlled through design and also through standardization and law. Um, and so this kind of um, framework of, um, uh, of the... Uh, the unfolding levels of analysis of Internet of Things data also sketches a number of places and relationships where our dilemmas of responsibility collide with, our, uh, with the dilemmas raised by, the dat by datification as a form of citizenship. So if we're, if we're expected to be acting as ideal data citizens by sharing our data, um, should the acquisition always um, be accompanied by our explicit consent. If our explicit consent means that no real action can be taken. If the aggregation creates um, profiles of communities, for example, that have particular protected qualities, um, does that mean that we cannot, can no longer take um, action based on this data? So there are a number of potential responses to this. Um, and in the final section of this talk, I want to present some possible ways to address these dilemmas of connected experience. Um, and I'm going to go rather quickly through most of them and focus on the final one, which is the ethical. Um, so the first of these questions, um, which has to do with thinking, about, thinking through the consequences of the responsibility particularly in automated decision-making, is a normative one. So there have been recently attempts at regularizing the processes of, the compu of computational or algorithmic processes that underpin the transformation of data, that take action um, at trying to bring a kind of um, normative oversight to the analytics level not to the collection level, not to prevent the collection of data, um, because it is now well, well understood that the collection of data may happen in places where consent cannot um, legitimately be given, and that the analytics of data may create situations in which discrimination occurs in ways that cannot be well described by the designer of the system. So computer science colleagues, including um, Joshua Kroll, who I've had um, some very interesting um, uh, debates with over the past couple of years, have produced um, a kind of strategy for identifying um, places um, and, and, uh, and modes of, of ensuring procedural regularity of algorithms as a means of making algorithmic systems accountable so that we can push um, the, uh, the assessment of this chain of analysis um, up into a level beyond the personal. Um, the second set of responses um, are legal and institutional. 
Um, and these include both the kinds of responses that Alessandro will talk about in his talk just following mine, but also um, institutions and organizations that are seeking to, um, to uh, create different modes of institutional action to address these the, uh, the, um, the dilemmas that are currently raised by the role of intermediaries that I sketched. Now, if, let's say, the smart city intermediaries that I described were not companies with their own data ethics policies, with their own perhaps very bad data sharing practices, but in fact public institutions, their accountability might be differently located. And so this is behind a number of strategies to try and address um, accountability in relation to data aggregation at the civic level. And there's quite a lot of work being done in the city of Barcelona, for example, um, on what they're calling a new deal for data. Um, there are also a number of small organizations that are trying to act as data brokers in the public interest. And these include um, proposals for data co-ops. Um, some data co-ops will let you set a price for your own personal data. And some proposals for data co-ops are about collectively doing the, bro the brokerage that I talked about earlier. So instead of delegating the responsibility for determining how to optimize your data to companies who then sell the data and their optimizing technologies back to governments, the data co-ops are proposing that people self-organize for this. And finally, there are um, increasingly um, uh, sort of new ways of thinking about the instruments of regulation. I'll leave that to Alessandra to talk about. I think also, however, there, are so there is a very important place for critical responses to all of this that dig in to how we think about data and how we think about this process of datification uh, in relation to our citizenship. And here's where the ethics comes back in. Because we can think about this process in terms of its outcomes, or we can think about this process in terms of how it is designed. And one of the, th the ways th that we have been um, working on this within the Virtue Project is not only to think about the outcomes for citizens, but to think about the, the, the process through which these technologies and processes get designed. And we, we have this radical idea that people who build these processes are not trying to be horrible. We think that people are actually just trying, to, they are trying to do a number of things, but they are likely not trying to be horrible. So we've been experimenting with the idea of virtue ethics. Um, and Sigmund Bauman, who I, I, many of you may know, who is a, Pol a Polish sociologist and who passed away this week, um, argued that the conditions of modernity make it impossible for individuals to act ethically. This was one of his big claims. And the, the sort of project of virtue ethics follows on from this assumption. Bauman said that the structures of modernity, which separate individuals from each other and create social relations of differential power and obedience to structure, make it really difficult to conceive of true collective ethical projects. So instead of thinking, how can I do a really good ethical contribution to the Internet of Things, people think about how to do their job effectively, even though they know that it's putting into practice this unfolding of um, unfortunate and perhaps unethical relationships. And so this makes people feel simultaneously guilty and powerless to change the structures. And within the data-enabled technology design realm, these dynamics play out in the way that individual users are constantly heckled by tech companies and advocates to protect their personal data, right at the bottom of my diagram, acquisition. Oh no, should I like uh, uh, should I tell my Fitbit that it can collect my data? Well, if I do, if I if I don't let it go into the cloud, then I can't compare with my past, and nobody I can't compare with my friends, and so and we're constantly bombarded as individuals with this notion that we should protect our personal data while simu simultaneously being subject to industrial models that are predicated on that co same constant access to data, same limitation of choice, and the same exploitation of big data that happens in ways that ca can't take account of the impact on people. 
So I think that the ethical constraints of modernity that Bauman identified maybe should inspire us to rethink our ethical positions. So I want to kind of advocate for a re-examination of the principles of virtue ethics. So virtue ethics is concerned with the process of becoming able to act ethically and to display virtues, whatever those virtues might be. The virtue ethics literature has listed some, but I'm a bit radical. I think there might be others. I think they might come from the people who are actually doing things in the world. But central to the idea of virtue ethics is an idea of a good society. And that a good society has some virtues, some good things connected with it. So you shouldn't mistake this project for me calling that for a kind of like ideal state of human affairs. Look, we're going to open up the windows. The sun will shine in. We will all become virtuous. No, 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 no. I'm not asking for you to agree with the things that I think are virtuous. The way I interpret the project of virtue ethics and technology is to propose a means to interrogate how and in which ways we might identify and put into practice some of the qualities that are essential for human flourishing. And this is what philosophers talk about all the time, human flourishing. A good society, there, there are likely things that we can agree on that we consider to be foundational for a good society. And I think that most people can identify some of these, and that I also think that people practice some virtues every day. And they're not necessarily enacted smoothly. We don't become anything with ease, whether enlightened or virtuous. The true project is in the becoming. And I, that's what we really would like to examine. So following on from this kind of invitation, not only to think about the institutional responses to the problems of data, not only to think about the normative responses of the problems of data, but to think as well, critically, I'd like to advocate for considering how we might want to allow people to understand themselves as being able to enact ethics, even in the places and times when they don't think that they are, like at work when you're just trying to get your job done, or in your relationships um, with the other people that you see every day. So I also think, so I think we should do this as a means to strive for a social transformation. Why not? To create a world where the consequences of one's actions create a difference. I want to get past what Bauman identified as the impossibility of acting ethically under modernity by both looking at what we do in our everyday practice as potentially ethical and also striving to transform the world as we currently live in it. So the ethical subject who's thinking about his or her decisions and personally responsible for being ethical may never appear in this project. And I think we will probably see virtues as things that just kind of come together out of collaborative practice. And I am also not totally sure that we're ever going to achieve any of the things that I've listed as what I would like to achieve, but I I'm looking forward to addressing this formidable challenge as part of the Virtue Project and with the rest of the Virtue team. Um, and finally, I'd like to invite you all to consider in your own work and your own practice and your own lives how to address the dilemmas of connected experience. Thank you very much.